So what we're going to talk today is on a serverless integration with Camel and Kubernetes. That's what is we are going to see today. Like how many of you work in the integration space? How many of you do integrating of applications? One, two, a few hands. How many of you know Camel? Apache Camel? One, okay. So all right, so I'll give you some introduction about these things. Don't worry that what these are. Uh, so what you're going to see today is like how do we take Camel? How do you take integration and take them into a serverless way, right? How do we do serverless way of integration? That's what we're going to see today. All right, this is serverless, <laughs> right? <laughs> So it was funny, like, so um, I, I usually use this slide because I, I think a lot of people felt initially, even including myself, like when I was first heard the word serverless, I thought like people were saying to me, okay, serverless, there is no servers, there is no data centers, there is no machines running. I was wondering like, how did it really happen? Like, how do you do coding, right? What happens to your system? Maybe you're going, I was, in the moment I was thinking like we're going back to the age old way, we get some EXEs, install the EXEs, run the EXEs on, on your boxes and start running. But finally, this is not serverless. So we heard a few introduction, of, a fair bit of introduction from Burr in the previous session, like what exactly serverless is. I'll go a little bit deeper into that, and we'll also see how we can apply on the integration space as well. So literally what it means is that, it's that that does not require a server management, because I don't need to install an API, I don't need to install anything else there, I just need to go ahead and do no server management, my platform takes care of what needs to be done, and then it has a frying grain deployment model. I'll come back to this in a second when I show the demo what exactly I mean by a fine grain deployment model for running a serverless. But a very important stuff is that it executed, scaled, and built in response to the exact demand need, right? So when I request it, something comes up, and then it gets executed, and something goes out. So that's exactly what serverless means. It's on-demand request kind of thing, on-demand thing which gets, comes up, does a job, goes out, right? A typical example of that, we could imagine like, for example, I run a cron job, right? This is a, it's a very easiest example which you can think of. I run a cron job, let's say the cron job starts at, let's say, 12 in the night, and then finishes at 12.15, right? That's an example. What usually happens is that we keep running the servers all throughout the day, and then we say, that, okay, the job starts, and then let's say warming up starts at 11.55, and then it executes, starts from 12 to 12.15, and it gets executed, and then after that it goes off, right? After that, my system again is becoming idle, which means that I'm wasting resources the rest of the time. So in idle case, what you have to do is like basically I have with serverless, what I'll typically be doing is that I'll be running something like that, but what happens, it starts at 11.55, does some warming up, whatever is required, executes what's needs and goes off. In that way, what happens is that you can save the resources there, you can save your cost there and use it somewhere else. That's our whole principle behind that. So let's see what benefits, right, why we want to do serverless. So in a, in a case, if you imagine like that, one of the things is that I want agility in cloud environment. Right? You'll see a K-native example as well. With thinking K-native in mind, like is K-native is what I'm going to use to run my serverless workloads. With agility, I can take the same K-native uh, platform and deploy it on Azure or Amazon or Google or Alibaba or any cloud provider you want to do. Right? But I'm going to get the same thing, same agility. I can move it easily without doing any uh, big change. Right? That's what I mean there in any cloud environment. The second one is event-driven cloud-native applications, right? Half late, like most of the companies, most of the enterprise organizations, basically what we do right now today is that we want to have Azure also, we want to have Amazon also, we want to have GCP also, you want to have your private data center also, right? What we mean by this is like we call them as hybrid cloud infrastructure. So in hybrid cloud infrastructure, what basically happens, I want something to be communicating across the clouds. For example, I want, let's say a compute instance is created in Amazon, I want the event data to go to Azure to do something else, right? But what basically happens, each cloud does its own different way. So what we wanted to have is, we wanted to have a way, a standardized way by which the metadata or data is exchanged between the clouds. So that's what CNCF did, Cloud Native Computing Foundation, they created a spec called as Cloud Events. Using Cloud Events, what I can do is like I can have a data exchange in a Cloud Event specification format. And in case, in this case, Knative naturally supports cloud event, you know, and the Knative eventing supports cloud event based specification. So I can start exchange data between various clouds. The third one is that focus on business differentiation. So for me, like it's like this, right? Let's imagine a case I want to start a proof of concept. Some, some technology, something I had to verify. So basically I estimate that, okay, it takes me a week to get this proof of concept done. And then what we have usually do is like, we spend Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, including even a part of Thursday, setting up my environment, right? In what cloud, what software I require, 
what are other things I need to do, I spend which means technically I am spending 80 percent of my time just setting off my environment. But actual your business thing is that I want to prove whether this particular concept or a technology works for me, right. That is what your more energy has to go into, right, which ideally what we do is like you spend 80 percent setting up the environment and just 20 percent doing what is required for you to verify, right. But that is not focus on business, right. We are doing the business digress and setting up the environment. Basically when you move to cloud, I mean serverless way of doing things, what happens is that your platform knows how to run your application. All you need to give is that, okay, this is what you need to run for me, run this for me, that is all. Which means that that is your POC, in which case you maybe minutes, seconds, hours, anything to get it performed in Kubernetes or Kubernetes way, it is just going to be one deployment that I am going to do, which is going to run in a serverless way, my concept is proved, right. I do not need to worry about how do I create a server underneath, how do I deploy my application, how do I deploy my other stuff. I do not need to worry all those things, I just write a couple of commands, it creates an environment for me in Knative and then runs and then deploys, tests whatever you want to do and then turn it down, okay. That is where I increase more on focus differentiation which means that when I am able to do all these things, I can apply the same concept to my business and then make my faster features get into quickly than waiting for anything else, right, spending time on infrastructure. And last, consistent and scalable operations, what I mean by this is that if you go, if you are using Knative, uh, we can get a consistent scalability across any environment, right, because it is the underlying platform to run a serverless workload is Knative. So Knative takes care of how to scale, how to scale up, scale down, uh, horizontally or vertically or whatever you want and then you can just, you do not need to worry about how my application will behave, right. In any given cloud provider, any given platform, my application is exactly going to behave the same way, right. What happens with this is that end of the day, I am achieving a better resource and cost optimization which means I can take these resources which is spent unnecessarily somewhere else, take them out and give it to a particular resource where it might need, right, and can save the cost, invest in something else. So this is something which we achieve because of this. What happens is that um, something which we need to keep in mind, uh, this is usually a trend of the industry, a trend how we actually do a coding or development architecture or whatever this. So I classified um, basically three different architectural styles which we have today, which we commonly use today. The services, which is your monolithic based application or anything client server model, and then we have microservices, and then we have functions. I'm just taking serverless to be functions because people always confuse between functions and serverless, right? Whenever I say serverless, people say it's fast. How many of you say it's serverless is fast? Serverless is not fast, right? Serverless is a way of doing thing, agar architectural style, whereas fast is one of the ways by which I can do serverless. FAST is not the serverless, right. People always have the confusion. Whenever I say to people, I say, okay, serverless, okay, I do FAST. Not necessary. I will show you an example. I am going to deploy a microservice to be running on a serverless way. It is not a function, which means that I can run any given program. I, wherever I can do Java dash jar or a Linux container, I can make this Linux container run in a serverless way. So just take this thing out of serverless is not equal to FAST. So FAST is one of the way I can do serverless. The why I am putting this here is because I want you to decide what you want to do, okay, which means that when to choose what. So this is one of the important things we need to think about when you are doing serverless architecture style or microservices or even your traditional way of doing building applications. What we always have is that we get carried away with the new things that happen in the industry, right. How many of you agree to that? Something new comes, okay, I want to try this, I want to apply it to my next project, I want to get it executed, but your next project, what happens is that it is not suited for the case and you will have a lot of issues after that, right, and a lot of money waste, resource waste, etc., etc. So what I basically tell here is that choose what you want. For example, if you want to have a high control and high complexity, let us say I have a lot of confidential data which I want, do not want to be in cloud, I want to let it keep it in my, within my data center, in that case like I still encourage you to go with services, a client server, a monolith or a modular monolith kind of stuff and then keep it within your environment, all right. If you are going to have microservices where I feel okay, I do not have too much, I do not need to too much control but I want to quicker redeploys, new feature getting released quickly, in that case that is where you want to do microservices which is kind of single responsibility pattern. In case if I want to do even, even more, one more thing level up, I say okay, I do not need worry about something which is there frequently but what I want to do is just only 10 minutes of the day it is getting used or 20 minutes of the day it is getting used, then that is where I want you to go with functions, right, where it goes up, does the work, comes down. Again where I have low productivity and low control and microservices sit somewhere in between this, right. And people will always say that, okay, 
do monoliths to microservices, your problems are solved. How many people heard this word? Monolith to microservice. I mean, a lot of things from the salespeople as well. Salespeople always say to sell the microservice thing. They say, okay, you want to go for a monolith to microservices, right? No, you don't do that, right? The problem is that if you're doing monolithic bad, then you're going to do microservices worst because your complexity increases with microservices because it gets distributed. You have network class services. You need to expect failures. You don't know how your application behaves on failures. There are a lot of other things which follows that, right? So what I encourage you is that if there is no need for you to do services, you don't need for you to break the services, then don't break it. Still run it as it is, because if it's giving you what is expected, then don't break it for the sake of breaking it. Right? In case, what I also suggest you is that then you feel, in some cases you might feel, okay, uh, this functionality can be run and can be quickly changed. It's this particular responsibility, then that's where you take this one and make them as microservice and run them as microservice. And within the microservices, I'll be having 10 different actions or functions or behaviors. If you're having something like that, then what I suggest to you is that we can try to see if we can make those behaviors or actions into own functions, right? You can run as a serverless function. In that case, what I say is microservices is a single responsibility pattern. If you go to functions or serverless, it's going to be single behavior pattern. And I'm just going to mimic one single behavior as thing which is going to get executed, run for you, and come down. Make sense? Agree? Right. But what does Camel has to do here, right? right? Since people don't know about Camel, I just want to give you a short introduction as a Camel here. Camel is a Java-based platform. Uh, it's kind of an integration platform for us. Like I've been using this for more than 10 years right now. Uh, and then you can also have, it has 20, 250 plus components as there. What I mean by components here is that I can kind of talk to uh, approximately 250 different types of systems. For example, SMTP, FTP, uh, SAP, or anything as you name it, right? I can have REST, DSL, et cetera, et cetera. The thing here is like it also gives you DSL, which means that you don't literally need to write a Java code. I can, I can, I can also write as XML. You'll see an example where I'll be writing a JavaScript code, but that gets run as a Java, Java code end of the day, right? The camel takes care of doing that as well and can integrate it with anything. This is where you might need to know a bit of Java, right? When I want to extend, right? When you want to extend for your, con, your custom functionality, then I have to take camel and extend camel to do your custom functionality, okay? But what happens is that we thought like, okay, all these days, even a few years before, even I was doing few projects around camel, the idea is like I still need to run camel in a serviceful way. I mean to say like I was to run a camel server, which is called as Fuse, which is a Red Hat subscription. So we have to run that 24 cross 7 for integration to work. Take the, take the similar example, right? Usual integration, a very simple integration is that I have some file getting dropped in your FTP server. I pick it out and then transform that CSV or XML or JSON or anything and then send it to another system, right? This is usual way you do this. But what happens is that your integration keeps running all the day, right? Throughout the day, it keeps running and then probably it gets executed maybe end of the day, right? For probably the last, last fag end of the day, let's like 11.55 or something. And then it gets executed, does this transform, throws the data out to a second system and then that's all its job is done. But for that, I need to have this Fuse server or a JBoss server which you usually have which keeps running 24 cross 7. But what you're going to see today is that using another project based on Camel and Kubernetes, using Kubernetes, we're going to see like, can I do it as serverless? Mean to say, I just write my DSL, whatever integration needs to be done, let Camel K, the platform, decide on how do I need to run. Even if I want to run it a serverless way, I just tell it to run it a serverless way. It runs in the serverless way, even in integrations as well. All right? So let's see what it has. Uh, again, this is the same platform uh, based on operator SDK. I think that these are all, a lot of Kubernetes stuff here. It's a platform based on OpenShift and Kubernetes, and it's based on core operator SDK. How many of you know about Kubernetes operators? Okay, one, two, three. Okay, so operators are the way by which, the new way by which we can install things onto Kubernetes. You would have heard about Helm, you would have heard about something else. So what operator basically does, it helps to install and maintain your software, right? Typically, like it's a human, software operator, it behaves like a human software operator sitting and running those things for you. Right? There is a operator hub spec, I think I'll show you that on my screen when I show you the OpenShift console. There is an operator hub, you can go find out all these operators, what are the operators available from there, and then install those operators whichever is required for you. So by default OpenShift doesn't come with any kind of installation, but you can choose what operators you want to install. I'll show you a few what are installed on my cluster today. It's a community driven project and we still don't have a 1.0 release. We just did a 1.0.1 milestone one couple of days back. So that's the latest release we have. So what it does, 
Before we see what it does, I want to know uh, how many of you do Kubernetes deployment? Very familiar since today's morning session, right? So first what you'll do is like I'm going to write the same Kubernetes deployment and then we'll see how do we convert that into serverless deployment, okay? That's going to be the first thing which we do. So let's jump to the demo now, okay? All right, so I'm going to use the visual code, studio code here. Uh, let me put a new file. I say call this app.yaml. Okay, and then I say kind. Okay, so this is a quick, easy, quicker way to get your deployment run with Visual Studio Code, which has a Kubernetes plugin running. So it gives you the YAML, so you don't need to write the hard code, the YAML completely by yourself. So I'm just going to call this application as greeter. All right, since Kubernetes, we're going to have a service here, I just need to say what service I want to be here. So I just say match the labels like this. And then again, I have to say they use the same label here as well. I just say greeter. And I call my app as greeter here again. And then I'm going to use a pre-built image. Uh, I use a registry query, uh, dot io slash Red Hat developers, key native tutorial, Peter, and it's a Quarkus based application. So I'm just going to give this as Quarkus. And then I'm just going to say uh, 8080 or 1990 is going to be the port that I need to say. So this is a very basic uh, elementary deployment file that you usually run. So this is what I'm going to run right now. And then obviously I need to define a service. So what I'm also going to do is like, I'm just going to define a service again. So I say, okay, uh, app <coughs> kind. I do the same thing, just copy the same labels so that it's easy for you to map. The usual mistake what people do when writing their first Kubernetes application is putting the mappers on. So once you don't put the right label selectors, your services will not be mapped. I'm just going to say the same port here as well so that it gets given for me. So I write, I've written a service uh, and I have written a deployment. So I'm going to take our existing app image, Docker container or Linux container image, what I call as, and then I'm going to do the deployment. So how do I do this? I'm going to get back to my command console and then I say, okay, CD dash, I go to the demo folder. Let's see if I have this YAML and then watch OC get pods. I say oc create dash f app dot yaml. All right, I'll have a service created and then I should, uh, should be having something created for me right here. There is a deployment that gets created here. And then oc get svc, I'll have the service also get created. All right, the container is running. Let's see when the container is running for a second. We're just pulling the image right now and then you should be seeing the container running for us, okay? So since the service is not exposed, I need to expose the service, OC expose SVC greeter, so that I get a URL. And then I say OC get routes. All right, I have the route as well here. So I need to do a quick change here. So let me, I just delete this and recreate it again. I want to distinguish between the Knative service and this service. So let me go back to my, where was I? Um, app.yaml. I just call this as greeter SVC, just to, just to give a different name to identify from the other one. So let's go back here and then do the same stuff, create it again. And then OC delete. Delete routes, greeter. I just, as I'm going to create a different service here, and it should be having it running in a second. I just expose the service, OC expose SVC, greeter SVC. I'll, I'll come back to think why I changed this name. All right, so now when I go to my console back, uh, my OpenShift console is here. And then what I'm going to do is like, I log in as this guy. And then we have a customer and then we go to networking and then we find routes 
we will have the customer out here, I just need to go to this project called as tutorial 3, that is where we are in. So, I have a Gritter SPC thing and I call this up, I get this hello world right, so sorry, just a Gritter saying hi Gritter or something like that, this is just something, so, so this is what I write to do it as a serverless right, you see what I want you to watch is this space, we are one of one right now. So, what I am going to do is I am just going to go back here to my uh, YAML, uh, where is that, here, sorry, right here and then what I am going to do is like I am just going to copy this and then paste it into a new one and then I save this as uh, KSVC YAML, okay, just Kubernetes uh, Kubernetes service, I do not need a service anymore. I will come back to this why and then we have talked about CRDs, this is going to be uh, serving.knative.dev slash v1 alpha 1, A A -L -P -H -A 1 and then this is going to be called as a signed service, I am just going to call this a service here same way we find it out right. So, for example, like like what Burr showed in the last thing, I just going to say OC get CRD grep K native and I get all the K native CRDs here. The one which we are interested is services.serving.knative.dev. This is what we are going to look about right now and then this is what we are going to create and then I am just right creating there. I do not need this metadata labels anymore because I am not going to do this anymore here. And then I also do not need to have a name because the name gets automatically generated by Knative. So, that is all I require. Now, if you see the amount of service YAML that I am going to do for Knative, which is serverless way, exactly same app because I am using the same image, I am not changing the image. But what you need to write has come down because I know few things that needs to be done automatically. For example, I need to create a deployment, I need to create a service and match this with the route everything will be automatically done by Knative behind the scene because it knows what needs to be done. The same boilerplate you do for every application deployment. Since Knative does know all these things, it has abstracted those things out and it said okay, let us let me do this way, all right. So, uh, let us see what happens. I think I might not need the selectors as well. Uh, let me keep it for a second and see what happens to this and then I say, uh, come on or see apply or create a chef ksvc.yaml uh, hopefully if I am not wrong, done any wrong okay. Uh, okay. Internal error occur no service registered with service okay let me I think I am making some typo here let me find it out the exact API name mm, knative tutorial 6 Okay, just grabbing this name up from here and then I say go back here and then say it save it back here. Okay, probably I made a mistake there in service and then I do not need a selector as well. I just have a template and then I have these things let me create again there you go. And then since I have the service created, uh, let me go to CLI uh, and then I say o OC get KSVC, okay and it is still getting created. Uh, let me see if it is having, is getting created or not. Mm -hmm. Right, I do not think so it is getting created. So, OC get KSVC, all right. I will come back, come back to maybe it could be some errors here, uh, OC describe, I will come back to the error in a second, there is something wrong, OC get KSVC, let me describe this uh, OC get OC describe, OC describe KSVC creator. Oh, sorry. I guess I'm feeling sleepy. I think it says some error here. Uh, let's see what of what is the error it's there. 
uh, the route is still working to reflect the latest design specification, something it is taking time probably. So, let us come back to see it after some time to see if that get created. Uh, in the, so, basically it creates this is a way like well, which I can turn a, a probably an existing uh, Kubernetes deployment into serverless deployment right. So, because why I use this way is because the latest serverless spec Kubernetes spec 0 0.7 has lot of changes. So, I have an example which actually runs with 0 0.5. Uh, but I need to update the tutorial to reflect 0 0.7. What 0 0.7 has done is that they have literally maintained the same Kubernetes deployment, but they have removed some parts. You just need to remove some parts from it to make it working for you, right? And then change your Knative serving and service, all right? Uh, let me come back to that in a second. Maybe it's something wrong with that. I'll try to delete this uh, again, and then probably I'll show you a deployment with a different one. Uh, OC delete uh, KSVC uh, YAML. And then I also change the uh, app.yaml as well, so that I do not have all these things deleted. Uh, let me go to 0 01 basics. Uh, so, this is the Kennedy tutorial what you are referring to. I am just going to deploy a similar one, just the same greeter example here uh, OC create dash f uh, uh, service dot remote dot yaml, okay. OC get pods. I think the greeter is getting created there. You should see 0 of 2 here that is getting created right there. And then let us see OC uh, get case we see. And then you have a greeter service getting created uh, there for us. And then it will throw you an URL with which we can access the service as well. So let us see if why I do not know why it is taking so much time because it is getting created. Or oh, okay. I can use kubectl as well for this, uh, kubectl get knative services dot, okay, all right. I have a greater service here, uh, created here. So, I say OC get KSVC, hopefully I should have it right now. I have the URL here. I just open the URL right now. Uh, what happened? Okay. Uh, I say HTTP. I'm more. All right. So it's getting the same greeter thing which you saw earlier, the same application, same image. But I'm running in a serverless way. I just leave the screen right now for you because you will see the service getting terminated because I'm not getting used. By default, it takes one and a half minutes. That's what the very minimum we can go with Knative. Until one and a half minutes is there, it will wait for the request to come. If no request come in next one and a half minutes, then it automatically starts to terminate, all right. So, this is how like we start to deploy even take a basic application. The application which I am running right here is not a function. It is still old, my same old greater application which is a JAX RS resource, REST resource. I just still wrote the same application, but all I did is that I encompassed that inside a service serving YAML which I showed you. And then I deploy the same thing again. So, which in this way it became serverless automatically and it will wait for your request until sometime. I think probably I will have it, have it running again. You can see it is getting out as well. So, but what we want to do right now is that I want you, I want us to try the same thing probably uh, Burr introduced all these things. So, I will try to skip this up. And then what Knative basically does for us is that it takes your source. For example, I'll, if you are in the next session, I will be showing the same example about how do you build it from sources, right, using Tekton pipelines. So, I take source, I build it to a container, which means that I am containing that into a Linux container. The moment I convert that into Linux container, what I also do is like I want to give you an URL, right, by which I can access the application. That is what I do with serving. The serving gives me an URL to the application. That is that's what we see when they put OC get case, we see you got an URL by which I can access the service, so that I can start the service, keep it running, get the response, etc. And if I am using an event based system like Kafka or anything else, then I can use produce and consume events as well. In this way, what I can do is like these are the basic building blocks. I can take these things to build my application in serverless way, right? So, if once we have do this, what also happens is that with camel, what happens is that I get all these 250 components, which is allows you to connect to multiple different applications or to multiple different integrations. I get all these 250 components along with enterprise integration patterns, like the common enterprise integration patterns, what we have and take it on top of Knative to give that the serverless flavor, which means that I can run the serverless thing on top of this 
and then still use Kubernetes platform because Knative needs Kubernetes to run all these things in serverless way. So how do we do this? Let us take a simple example here. Let me go back to my uh, the non-working model. So this is a very basic example. You see here uh, I am writing a route. This is a camel DSL for a, for a thing. So with this camel DSL what I am basically saying is that every 3 seconds just say hi Bangalore. That is it. And I am just because it is a very simple example where I say that okay from this which could be a producer or a consumer from this particular staff go to this particular log right. So I am just saying it to log it to the console but te technically what you do in integration is that we send it to a different piece of thing right to put it in another message queue or a Kafka topic or anything else and then we keep chaining them together. In this case what I am trying to do is like I am just saying okay run this integration only in this way right. I just say that okay I just give you in JavaScript or a groovy I have a groovy example also the same thing. You can also write in XML, you can also write in Golang as well that is also possible but the DSL is going to same. You have to learn the camel DSL to write this particular one. I am writing this stuff again and what I am going to do is like let me go here. You see that this, this one got terminated. So how do I invoke that back? I am going to show you an example to invoke that back. Oh sorry. The moment I say this. I see the container gets created again and then the service is coming up and then it will serve your request which means that it is it's gone down, it is no longer required so it will go down and when it is up it starts up and then serve your request and it will be running for next one and a half minutes again and then terminate back. So that is how we can run your serverless workloads as well. So uh, since I am going to deploy the same application again, uh, so what I do is like OC delete dash F um, service not remote dot YAML. So that I can I can use the same name, otherwise I have to use a different name in my code. So what I'm going to do is like I'm just going to do the same name again here. It's getting terminated in a second. I say camel. That's a tool. So to get the camel, what you have to do is like you have to go to uh, Apache Camel K. This is a GitHub URL for Apache Camel K. You can go here. You'll have the binary. How to download the binary and install the binary. So this is a Camel K binary that we need to have. That is what I am doing here. So, camel k binary is already configured. I say camel k and then I say run dash dev. I will come back to this dev mode in a second and then I say greeter.js. Okay, I am not there, right? So, cd maps camel k demo. Now, I say camel run dash dash dev greeter.js. The moment I say you see one more camel container getting created for you and now this is not in a serverless mode. If you see there is only one container which is running, this is not in a serverless mode, this is going to print everything in a log for you. You see the camel thing getting deployed which is a Java application but you write in JavaScript but camel K takes care of converting that and running as a Java application for you and then I am just starting to say and just keeps logging onto the screen every 3 seconds. Right. What is a dev mode basically means is that for example like if I if I am if I'm a developer basically what I want to do is like I want to do start something keep working on something for example in this case and then I change something I want the live reload to happen. For example what in this usually in the case happen is like I give it a file and then it goes to camel integration definition which is and the camel key underlying thing which runs inside Kubernetes. It actually takes that and compiles that into a Java application and deploys the application for you which means that for the integration I do not need to write any kind of deployment YAMLs or service YAMLs or routes or anything else. Camel K takes care of doing those work for you and then it uses Camel K operator and basically and deploys your pod right. Basically the what operator does is that it reads this YAML and it knows what needs to be created and it deploys a pod for you. That was exactly happening for you. I just deploy the JavaScript file. JavaScript file was recompiled into a Java file and deployed and the application was started for you right. In this development workflow I want to also know how the live update works. So let us go back here and then uh, okay what is that I just I will just change this to hello. The moment I save this you will see the integration getting updated here and you will also see a new container getting created here for you which means that I can do update delete whatever I want to do with my application a new application gets started and you will be seeing a new logs coming here for you right which is hello right it should not be high it will basically says that it should be hello and then it gets terminated and then the old content getting terminated and then your new one getting started for you 
and then starts logging the same thing what is required for. In this way what I can do, I can have a continuous development life cycle, maybe say I can develop something, test automatically and then stop something, change something and then see if it is coming without me redeploying it. Traditionally in any integration service today what you basically do when you want to do a new deployment, I have to stop the existing application, build it, deploy it, right? I do not need to do this anymore, right? So we saw this serviceful way of doing things. So what I need to do with the serverless way and also like it clears the resources once I terminate that, you see this getting terminated here. What is also nice about CamelK is that to do it in the same thing in a serviceful way, serverless way, what I need to do is like I just need to tell Camel that it is going to be a K native endpoint. So that I get a URL for this and then I just use any name you want, I am just saying it is default and then I go back to hello again. So what I do is like when I run this again, you will now see 0 of 2 getting run in a second for you, 0 of 3 which I have Istio also involved in that. So which means that right now I have 0 of 3 running for me and then when I do OC get KSVC, you get a greater URL, it, you do not have a URL yet because it is still coming up. So you will also have the application running for you and then you got a URL now, alright. When I give the URL, the same URL when I say HTTP body, I got hello Bangalore now, right. It is exactly same integration which you are getting deployed but right now I am deploying it in a serverless way. Like if you leave this for another one and a half minutes, we will be seeing that this getting automatically terminated. In this way what I also can do is like I can run serv I mean service integrations with Apache camel based integration in a serverless way also, right, because integration not necessarily need to be run 24 cross 7. What else I have to uh, have in the slide and I will also allow you to try this one if you go to uh, bitly.ly. Sorry, yeah, you have to send these properties probably. So this is an example, I just change this to show because now in this case what happens, you do not need a time delay because whenever I call using the URL, I am going to go to the service, otherwise it will not go to the service. So bitly.ly Kennedy tutorial, uh, this is something which I am working on. I think right now um, I have this 0 0.5 release for Knative. So it has all the things to get, I think probably build is deprecated, so you do not need build anymore. You have all these things like fundamentals of how running serverless with Knative. You can do serving, auto scaling, eventing, etc, etc. And then if you want to run with camel K which I am talking about, you can go here to integration using camel K. I have few set up here, how do you set up all these things. Let us take this one example of doing a message filter, right. This is one of the patterns which you have. What I am going to do basically is I am running an S3 kind of a server. Let me go and find the server out for us. So this is the one which I have. Uh, so I have two folders in my S3, uh, this is a local S3, the mocking S3 kind of stuff. What I am going to do is like I am going to upload two files here basically. So one is an XML file and one is a text file and then I am going to apply this enterprise integration pattern called as message filter. What it basically does it let whenever the file is getting dropped there, it will check for the file extension. That is a very simple example. If it is an XML, then it moves from the data folder to the top folder which I have there, okay. That is what I am going to do but again this is going to be done in a serverless way. So let us see what we have to do here. I already have these buckets. I am not going to create the buckets now. I am going to deploy this uh, particular application here. So I have it here I guess. Let me, yeah, this is the one. I will stop this. We do not need this anymore. I will make this bigger, right. And then I also have this here as well to drop, upload the data. I copy this and then I put it here. So now what happens soon, I uh, will see another app, app getting deployed, OC get pods, uh, grep, okay. So it is getting 0 of 3. I think as I told you right in this case, what I want so was one let once it is comes up, I will also do another thing. I feel that I do not want service mesh features here, right. I do not want service mesh, I just want it to be just serverless, okay. That is what the need of me for the hour. So what I need to do basically for that is that. OC edit KSVC, uh, let me find the KSVC name for it, OC get KSVC, okay. So this is called as uh, cartoon message mover. So I will just take this up uh, and then let us see if it is running, okay. 
OC edit case VC cartoon get more. What I have done is like uh, how many people know that you can change your editor to your wish like to do that do this uh, let me check echo So, what I have done is that I have set an environment variable for cube editor to be my Visual Studio code. When I do this what happens is that whenever I do OC edit like this it is going to take me to my Visual Studio code where I can go edit stuff which makes your life much easier for you because whenever you are editing YAMLs you need the space indentation to be proper. So, if you set that globally on a Visual Studio code so that when you edit it it gets automatically indented for you, you do not need to worry about that. So, what I am going to do right now is that to this I am going to say uh, if I am correct istio dot sidecar dot inject uh, istio dot io right uh, slash sidecar inject is false. The moment I do this what happens is that the service get redeployed uh, or let us coc get pods f and w and then the old cartoon mover is getting terminated and you will soon see the new one getting updated for you. I hope we get the new one right now in a few seconds. Oh, for some reason it is not maybe my annotation name is wrong let me find the right annotation name. Uh, this is the okay, sidecar that is here I am sorry about that. So, uh, when I change this one uh, to this deployment to come back here, edit this and then go back to this one and then change this way and then close it up. Hey, come on. <sighs> and I think it updated here and then you will see was that editor terminated ok let it go get it deployed. Right now what I am going to do is like I say uh, file. So, this is what I am going to do right now OC get pods let us see if it's come up that is still running. So, the moment I do this so I also need to add some files here I will go back here to my integration project all the instruction just copying pasting here. I am just going to upload this file, I am sorry, I am just uploading the data here, the data file. I have one more file to be uploaded, I just do this as well. Once this is done, I just going to run this curl. Uh, before I do this run, what I also wanted you to see is that let us go back to the console where I was running this file. Let us refresh this, I have two files here and I have no files here ok. Uh, and then you also have a tool I have a tool called as I think probably would have heard about this in the morning since during our session it is getting terminated again because it is not been inactive for quite some time. So, let us do this OC uh, stern cartoon I can see user container. Okay, right now we will not be having anything. The moment I give the request here, you will we'll see that coming up again because the request has reached that. Now, I am using a folder enrich, enrich pattern here, you will saw the application coming up right there because it got the request right now to process the file and soon in the logs you should see the files getting processed. Maybe it can also time out a bit um, and it starts to run, it gets the Istio pod run, it gets the serverless K native pod run and everything get added and now it starts to run. And then uh, I think you should get an example here. I do not know why this stern is not working here. Let us go back and check it here on our file, the file, and then let us go here and then do a refresh. We saw this message getting moved. It moved from the data folder to top folder, and my integration is right now running in a serverless mode because you saw the integration which I deployed was terminated because it was not used. And the moment I gave the request to process the file, it came up process the file moved into new folder. Now, after again one and a half minutes it knows that it does not require anything more it terminates back again all right. So, in this way I can also run any type of integration you have I think I have other examples as well here. 
So, I had three different patterns this is the message filter enterprise integration pattern there is something called as poll enrich where I can read the data basically from the application I think it also gives you this information as well. I can read the data for example in this case what I do is like in the example I have an XML coming in and I will read the XML and then split the top based on the country right I will create a country folder another thing and then start processing as well ok. These are all basic file examples because that is very easy to understand you can also write all complex examples as well. If you go to the camel case site inside the examples folder we have lot of other examples as well. And then I have also I have a content based router where I can do content based routing as well to go to one message handler to the other message handler based on what you get as part of the content right. That is why these are the very common integration use cases that you use very common integration patterns. You can but in this way I can do a very even very complex integrations running in a serverless way as well. If I do not need to be running 24 cross 7 then I can also run the serverless way as well all right. Let me take a quick check on where we are with the time I think we have 10 more minutes to go if I am not wrong right. So, the let us let us go back here uh, to see what else I have. I think I think that is pretty much I have probably I um, will throw you these slides um, for you to go and check this out the tutorials are there the camel kit tutorial the commands which I ran today is exactly reproducible from there. So, you can go grab those commands as well from there and then you also have the Istio tutorial which you can use to conduct Istio related stuff and then know about more about Istio whatever we talked today morning.